Welcome to Hark, the 87th Precinct podcast. This is our first podcast and we're looking at the very first book in this police procedural series by Ed McBain. So we're going back to 1956 for Cop Hater. Abbott, and I'm joined by Stephen Royston. Hello. And Morgan Brown. Hello. And um, th- that's my discussion team for this. Um, so why is it us three then? Why is it us three particularly? When, or rather, who was first onto the 87th precinct? I'm not actually sure. I would. I'm pretty sure that would have been Morgan. It you reckon? Um, could have been. Um, my dad got a box set of uh, the. Um, Orion Crime Masterworks series uh, when I was about um, 13 or 14 and that was just sitting around in my house and eventually when he'd read all of them he, he lent me some and the first book I read was Ice which I think is an early 80s. So was that a, a box set of all Ed McBain or was it a mix uh, it was of, a, it was of a crime? a mixture of things from Sherlock Holmes through to fairly contemporary stuff. Oh, right, okay. uh, but the Ed McBain was one of the things that particularly stuck with me. So that sounds like you've got you're the progenitor of our obsession, then. Could be. Um, and then it was probably you. I think so. Yes, I remember. I was looking back at the version I've got uh, with the princely sum of one pound in the front, and it it reminded me my grandfather gave me a five pound note, uh, and I bought uh, four of the first four all in order. On the same day from so you, Oxfam in Huddersfield. You started in a very logical way then. Well, this was, uh, yeah, five pounds only a few years ago as well. So, um, yeah, my uh, granddad was being very generous. Uh, but I uh, purchased the first four in order and that allowed me, my claim to fame is uh, reading all the 87th Precinct in order from the beginning. That's so a very good claim to fame. I might as well get that out there now because <laughs> yeah. it's uh, the so, most impressive. Uh, <laughs> which neither Morgan and I or I have done yet. So. No, definitely not. I think it but gives it you a different, uh, a different perspective to how, how things pan out, and it, but in no way does it you know, change your enjoyment should you read them no, I, not uh, in order. Uh, so. Yeah, um, yeah it's cause, and I suppose this is what we're going to get into with this stuff because <laughs> the nature of the books is such that you can pick up anywhere, really, can't you? But yeah, so obviously what's basically happened is we've spent the best part of 20 years sat around in pubs talking about books we like, films we like, music we like. And when we all, when eventually I started reading the 87th Precinct ones, because you two were, we were all talking about it. And it was like a, a bit of a revelatory moment, really, because <laughs> they are so, so addictive. Absolutely. Almost to the point of where for a little while you're not sure if they're good. And I don't mean that to be overly <laughs> critical, but when you first start getting addicted to a, se- a sequence of things, it's like, is it just the experience or is it the content? Fortunately, it is actually both, I think. Oh, Absolutely, most yeah. certainly, yeah. Um, but obviously, yeah, there's ups and downs in the in the series. Um, I'm sure we'll get to some of them. But I, I think, by and large, the consistency in, oh. of it is, is fantastic. So, right, there's a plane going by outside. So we're recording this in my uh, back sitting room, I'm going to call it. And so if there is lots of strange noises, it's because the heating's on full blast because it's freezing cold. And also there's a fridge in the room and we live in the world where noises happen. And we also make strange noises from time to time. And we also make strange noises. We certainly do. Yeah, although I have wrapped up the ladders which were creaking. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'll take a photograph of that and put it on the Twitter. Nice. Um, Okay, so... Orders of business, I think. One thing I think before we get started is, uh, do we have a spoilers policy? Because I don't think we can have one, can we? Because if we're doing this, do we try not to spoil things ahead? 
we, can't, we, we can try our best. Uh, I think we can try our best, can we? but it may prove totally impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Let, well, let's see. Well, it's nice to strive against the odds. Mm, um, it feels okay. very heroic. We'll, we'll, we'll see how we go with this. Yeah. I suspect we may end up giving something away. Right, I well... Think, I think if anyone's actually listening to, to this, then first, hello and thank you. And secondly, they probably... Uh, read, like, well, maybe they're reading along. Well, possibly, yeah. Hopefully, we should. Yeah, like it's we quite should do an audio book. Maybe you can add page now. <laughs> maybe you can add a spoiler alert afterwards in some in large font on something. Oh, oh, oh the, the end of the podcast. Uh, please note <laughs> if you just listened to this podcast and have not read the book, <laughs> uh, it did contain spoilers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't think we can really do much formal about that. No, we? no. I guess not. I, I said, yeah. So, uh, and the other thing I was going to ask about was, um, how are we going to rank them? Are we going to rank them? Ooh. Do we need a system? Um, I would... Um, uh, we could mark as we go along. Mark and mark. then then come up with a league table as, uh, as yeah. uh, the shows develop. That will be very difficult, because most will be seven, eights, nines out of ten, I would suspect. I guess so. But the odd um, ten. Yeah. I think, you know, one has personal favourites, I think. I can... S certain... Um, Certain entries do stick out in my head, yeah, but uh, ah, uh, not necessarily because they're any better, just perhaps slightly more memorable plots or slightly wackier set of circumstances, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think, I feel we, we, you know, so if we're not going to have a spoiler policy, we might be cheating ourselves if we don't have some form of a ranking system. Okay. And I'd like, a, I'd like to propose an out of five system. Now, I know that's quite controversial because it removes uh, gradations of. Mm -hmm. uh, of marking gradations um but i'm like to propose a um, how many police shields badges we award oh, so a nice. five shield system we well, could have a uh, um a, an out of five for plot and then a uh, another out of five for um mcbainisms contained <laughs> Is, is that not getting a little... Well, it's, I don't know, well, you know, information, isn't it? It's, it is. It's it's become obsessed with our uh, detail. <laughs> well, it would need a, a great uh, North Beer Run complex uh, scoring uh, uh, the reference, matrix and, the a, reference, and a, a Kenneth uh, uh, of its own. The reference, Stephen, Steve-O has just made is to the great North Beer Run, which is a group um, beer trip on trains that we take um, and the reference to Kenneth is, what's Kenneth the acronym for? I think it stands for something along the lines of calculating every number nearly every time honestly. <laughs> so, yeah. We'll so, have, we'll some, some such sort of, machine. We'll a bit of reprogramming sort of, of Kenneth. A and variable he, Kenneth to, uh, to help yeah. us do the scores. So Num so number, we'll of, uh, number of um, pigeon uh, stools uh, in the... Pigeon stools. Uh, pigeon stools. <laughs> Stool pigeons. Stool, even those as well, yeah. P pigeon stools. I don't know that there's any pigeon stools. <laughs> I, I imagine they're there somewhere, but... The Bristol pigeon stool chart. Um, okay, I think we'll perhaps... Well, all right, we'll, well, we'll try at the end of this to rank it perhaps on a couple of things and come up nice. with a system. There may be a, a break in recording to figure that out. <laughs> well, I think if that evolves naturally yeah, as I we go so. on, yeah, that I will so. uh, okay, um, so. be no bad thing. Right, well, I'm going to start things off then. I think, and this is what I want to do for everything before we get into the book. Sorry if you're desperate for us to get into the book, but I want to do this. I want some context, because I don't know about you, but I wasn't born in 1956. And if it was before I was uh, born, what, what, what was it? Well. It was before my time. How, how could we possibly know how if it was before our know? time? Um, anyway, all right, tell you what. I'll give you a bit of background on the original publication of the book. The original publisher was a company called Perma Books, which was owned by Doubleday. And that was sold to a company called Pocket Books in 1954. You can tell from the names like Pocket Books means they're not, these aren't supposed to be big grand releases. These are sort of pulp publications to some extent. A lot of what Ed McBain had been publishing under different names had been pulp stuff anyway. He was given a three book deal, which we all know because we've got the edition with the <laughs> foreword in it. So, yeah, he was given a three-book deal for a, a series of crime books, and he opted to choose the police to be the hero. Rather than a hero, he chose the police as a concept. Now, I'm sure we'll argue probably at some point that he ended up with a hero within the first three books, anyway, an individual hero, to some extent. But he, he was talking about a sort of uh, 
a gestalt hero in a mm. way, which was the police force, rather than the grand detective that had been the mm. the noir thing and the Victorian thing before that. Well, I think in the in the forward of the UK Orion edition, which is uh, a forward just about the the beginning of the series, uh, I recall he mentions in there a. Um, a belief that if anyone, when you're writing a novel, uh, a crime novel, if you've got anyone other than the police investigating, mm. you're already one stage in yeah. the land of fantasy. It requires the, a, a real leap of faith on behalf of the yeah, reader. Exactly, and I, I think he thought that one immediate way to remove that and cl- cluttering up quite a bit of the, the book, and obviously they're quite short uh, mm. novels, is just make the police the uh, yeah, because investigating by the 50s, uh, authority and the notion of like something like the Pinkerton detective agencies uh, dead in the water they really, kind of had it? their day in the, the 20s and 30s really and that had carried on in fiction for another 10 years or so but mm. yeah and there was a prevailing trend I think in other media films and TV and radio towards more realistic kind of police drama yeah and I think a lot of noir went that way as well so definitely the the noir hero shifted from the individual uh, maverick detective or down at heel detective who was also a maverick or it, and it started becoming thing uh, things like um, lawyers and, and and policemen and and the court system became the heroes while it was still telling these very sort of dirty stories about yeah. about uh, stool pigeons about betrayal about the mob and things like that mm. but yeah it moves towards a, a more formal thing and uh, so anyway Pocket Books published quite a few different types of things. So it's interesting to learn that uh, Ed McBain, as the writer of the 87th Precinct books, was um, with a publisher who would published these uh, following four <laughs> books. I'm sure we've all read these and can uh, talk about. In the Grip of Terror, 22 Nightmare Tales by the Greatest Masters of the Art. Edited by Groff Conklin. <laughs> ah, I'm a big fan of Groff's work. Who doesn't Excellent. love Groff? Groff Conklin. <laughs> Groff Conklin, yeah. Don't he'll be listening. Um, then also The Conquest of Fear by Basil King. <laughs> that's, that's not that's really funny about Basil King. Um, but also, How Shall I Tell My Child? A Parent's Guide to the Sex Education of Children by Bell S. Mooney. <laughs> 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 yep. I don't think that was fiction. Um <laughs> But this is 19... This is in the 50s, it probably was, yeah. yeah well, it, may, it might have been. Yes. You put your best suit on, <laughs> uh, hold hands, and... Uh, think and, uh, of England. Yeah, well, think of uh, Wisconsin. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know why I chose Wisconsin. I don't know anything about Wisconsin whatsoever. Something um, to do with cheese, probably. Oh, yeah, that's it. Um, and also, best quotations for all occasions, edited by Lewis C. Henry. Marvellous. And, you know, everyone's got that on their bookshelf. Ed McBain himself isn't Ed McBain, is he? he so he he's a, a man isn't. of many pseudonyms. So he was born um, Salvatore Albert Lombino in 1926. He was. Sal Lombino. Um, but he didn't really stay that for very long. Um, what other pseudonyms remember anyone? Um, most notably Evan Hunter, I'm sure, which it sounds an awful lot more um, waspy than uh, Salvatore L- uh, Lombino, yeah. which I imagine was probably a massive asset uh, in the publishing game at the time. Yeah. So Evan Hunter was the name that he chose legally, eventually, yeah. after being a, a pseudonym based on, uh, apparently based on some of the schools and colleges he went to. Is uh, his bird screenplay written under Evan Hunter? I think it's under Evan Hunter. Is it the? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. The, what Steve was referring to there is is the screenplay for the film The Birds, the Alfred Hitchcock film, which um, Ed McBain, Evan Hunter wrote. His only um, screenplay he did with Hitchcock because there was another aborted one. Well, he he, he was <laughs> writing Marnie. Was. He was writing the screenplay for Marnie, oh, yeah. but he um, he was fired from that because he disagreed with with Hitchcock over a rape scene. Um, I think he wanted it to be less aggressive less involved and hitchcock was all about basically the camera as rapist yeah so i think as i understand it is he basically evan hunter became his legal name he chose that eventually and he used that for his what sort of what i think he used to sort of say was like his non-pulp things his Mm. non-genre things 
I mean, this is perhaps not the time and place yet to get into the discussion of why genre books are so derided. Mm. But he used Evan Hunter for his serious stuff yeah. and Ed McBain. <coughs> excuse me, Ed <laughs> McBain for his um, genre work, particularly mm. the uh, Eight Seven yeah. Precinct. And I think did he use Ed McBain for Matthew Hope as well? He I think did, he yes. did. Yes, he did indeed. And then um, he definitely had some other pseudonyms. Didn't he did. He, he had lots. I've got a couple here. Richard Marston. Um, well, I say a couple. I've got that one. Evan, uh, Evan Hunt, uh, Hunt Collins. So yeah. I think quite a few of those books were later republished under the uh, the Ed McBain name. Uh, I, I, I think too when when the eighty seventh precinct books became popular. Yeah, yeah I think I, I think I've got a collection Ed McBain that I don't think I've read, and I think that's yeah perhaps re-releases of earlier. Because he did he, he started out working in in sort of pulp publication pulp publications he started doing sci-fi stuff one of my favorite facts about him is one of his sort of big breaks really was he decided to uh, to work in a literary agency or he got a job in a literary agency thinking this is the way into this world mm. and he was like a literary agent for people like pg woodhouse <laughs> and arthur c clark amazing and it's 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 like a generation thing that suddenly as soon as you put pg woodhouse into it and he knew pg woodhouse he mm -hmm. edited and worked with pg woodhouse that's a whole you know another nearly a hundred years backstory and he loves pg woodhouse stuff as if you've listened to any interviews with him he mentions him a couple of times and also he wrote sci-fi and arthur c clark was someone else that he, he worked with it's an amazing sort of background mm. to have as a developing writer Absolutely, yeah um but yeah, he's from New York, but the books are set, the 87th Precinct books are set in a city called... Isla. Well, the city's not called that, is it? Isla's the um, the island, isn't it? That's... Do they ever tell us what the city's called? No, I, I don't believe so, no. Nothing at all. They, we, no name ever given. Isla's basically Manhattan. More or it? less, yeah. So he's very, very specific on his fictional city where everything's set, but he is completely non-specific about... The city as a whole mm. which is amazing because the city is one of the characters in yeah. every single book but the precinct itself is in isola yeah, is it it not? Is, yeah yeah absolutely yeah um a little bit extra just to uh to, to get us up to speed before we get into the book in detail is he published uh, a few books like i say sci-fi and pulp stuff including brilliant loads of stuff with like um exclamation marks at the end of it including <laughs> the evil sleep and danger dinosaurs Yes. But he also published <laughs> The Blackboard Jungle, which is the most significant publication in terms of the the popular vision of, of teenagers, the new concept of teenagers, thanks to the film anyway, um, which made him, I think, probably quite a bit of money and set him up as a writer then. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's have a little 1956 quiz. I say quiz. <laughs> how, um, how old was he when oh, he wrote on. the first... <laughs> Mid twenties, he wasn't well, he was born that in old. 19, he was born in nineteen twenty six. Right, okay, yeah. So, so. He, he's basically Cop Hater is published in when he's thirty. So, yeah. so he's he's writing, but he's been published since fifty two. So he's been writing through his twenties. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah. yeah. So, okay, nineteen fifty six. Uh, who was a president? It would the have... U.S. president, not um, some other president. Was it Dwight D. Eisenhower? It was Dwight D. Eisenhower, of whom I know nothing. He fought in both the First and Second World Wars. His wife was Mamie. Mamie. Um, well, she, was that an attribute she had? She was very Mamie. <laughs> Given to naming. Yes. Um, who was the Prime Minister? That would have been um, Macmillan. It would not have been Macmillan. It, it would, have would have been the been, one before him. It would have been Anthony Eden. Yes, Anthony Eden, about whom I know nothing. <laughs> this is my history answers. He was the foreign secretary in the Second World War, I think. Or... I, well, I think he quit just before the Second World <clears throat> War. He actually resigned. <clears throat> uh, he was foreign he was, secretary for a long time. I know he was, uh, yeah, certainly a member of the establishment, anyway. Yes, he was a conservative MP, and uh, he was around for a long time. Um, who won the Super Bowl? Uh -huh. it, didn't, it didn't exist, exist then, did it? well who won the equivalent of the Super Bowl ah. very good that it was would good... probably have been uh, the Cleveland Browns it wasn't the Cleveland Browns oh. the Giants beat the Bears 47-7 uh, the Bears doing just as well over. these days <laughs> um, 
Who won the FA Cup? Uh, oh, let's go with someone like Blackpool. That's funny, I was going to say Blackpool. Well, you'd both be wrong. <laughs> uh, Man City beat Birmingham 3-1. Boring. Yeah, boring. Um, okay, who was... Um, I didn't realise there were going to be so many uh, questions. Well, yeah, we like to set up the... Well, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, who, yeah. who would have been uh, the biggest hit singles of 1956? Hmm. Um, I've got a top like, five listed here. Uh, Elvis Presley Elvis with that, that song that he did. The, the, well, those songs. Those that he did. many songs that he did. And Basically, guess, Hound Dog, Heartbreak Hotel, and yeah, Don't Be Cruel all, are like all the massive three, like, four, and hits, five yeah. in the chart. Not Definitely. one and two. Wow. Oh. Johnny Cash, he must no. have been. Well, he was around then because that's all the sort of Sun Records years, mm. isn't it? Um, the the biggest hit single of the year was a song featured in a Hitchcock film. Um, Doris Day? It was Doris Day. Que sera, sera. Brackets, whatever, will be. Marvellous. From uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much. Indeed. Um, and uh, the second biggest one was Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino. Oh. As featured Cracking. so memorably in the film 12 Monkeys by uh, Terry Gilliam. Anyway, there you go. That's some background for it. And if you didn't know all that stuff, then you do now. So Cop Hate is the first in the, in the 87th Precinct series of novels and that's a series he wrote from for nearly 50 years isn't it something like that long time yeah yeah I'm deliberately was, not having the correct information to yeah hand. it was well the 56 was the publication date the the, uh, the first cop hit uh, yeah. and i think it was 2005 ish i would think fiddlers was it that that the was the last fi- the final series. book so, uh, yeah it, it was still writing them very much when i started reading them um yeah. Somewhere towards the end of the nineties, and yeah, so and I think it, there's forty odd in the series. Is there? I think I, well, I think they actually might be up in the fifties. Mm. I could go and count them on my shelf. Well, or, we'll find out. When well, we've, uh, who will? How would we ever know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, perhaps uh, if only we could move this live to my bookshelf and we could count it. But yeah, Cop Hate is the first of them. It was filmed in 1958, and I've never seen the film. I've never seen it. No, uh, I believe. For some reason, they changed the name of the main character, Steve Carella, to Steve Carelli, which is almost like to make him more Italian, like it's, mm. it's more of a thing somehow. Yeah. Mm. Although thinking about, Peculiar. Uh, about this, so I've mentioned Steve Carella there, and he will be a name that will crop up in almost, well, he will crop up in every he certainly will. Every book and every episode. Where you can't talk avoid him, can you? But we mentioned before that Ed McBain himself, the Ed McBain, the author, whose real name was or oh, his birth name was Sal Lombino, changed his name to Evan Hunter. And it's it's interesting that he makes his main and most significant part of the 87th Precinct books an Italian cop. Indeed. Or a cop from Italian heritage. So it's really like he's not him, but he's his mm. closest representation yeah, in the books, probably. Like a little bit of a proxy of him, perhaps. Yeah, what he'd like to be if he was the cop, yeah. I, I think. It always struck me is that the... Um... The physical description of Corella is is somewhat similar to pictures you see of Ed McBain. At that well, this, I, I always thought anyway. This um, that, well that leads us on to a very important part of the books, and this is and it happens right from the off, really. Mm. It, which is that every book. Ha- so as I say, this is sort of a gestalt thing. It's sort of it's a team of policemen, policemen and women, in fact, working together. Um, but everyone. Every time they appear, they have their description. And so in 50 books, we get the same description 50 times. For more a or less. More, yeah. more or less. It's approximately the same exact sentence, isn't it, for <laughs> Corella and yeah, know, some so of the other characters? I think um, I don't want to do loads of quoting from it because I'd like people to read it and just figure it out for themselves. God damn it. What are we <laughs> going to do all of this work? Um, but I will just, because this is book one and because Steve Carell is such a significant figure, I will just read this paragraph from the book this is from page nine in your orion copies if you want to read along folks corella grinned he was a big man but not a heavy one he gave an impression of great power but the power was not a meaty one it was instead a fine honed muscular power he wore his brown hair short his eyes were brown with a peculiar downward slant that gave him a clean shaved oriental appearance 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 
so one so nearly well. got through so nearly got through that paragraph <laughs> without yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going back and doing it again he had wide shoulders and narrow hips and he managed to look well dressed and elegant even when he was dressed in a leather jacket for a waterfront plant I like the idea that if you were wearing a leather jacket you were a you know a ne'er do well <laughs> oh indeed yeah, yeah. Um, which you turned up in a leather jacket today didn't you Morgan I am known as a ne'er do well as so a modern day ne'er do well it, it makes sense um he had thick wrists and big hands. Well, which is yeah, really important. Well, there we go. I think, is. yeah, certainly a boiled down version of that is in. Absolutely. Uh, he, he I maybe, think every single book. He maybe doesn't do the full spiel, but you, you get some kind of. The oriental yeah, comment it's that interesting is. Thing he, about... he purposely puts that as the main. Um, and other the characters occasionally comment on it as well, don't they? Um, I mean, he did this partly because he wants every single book to be. Uh, one that you can just pick up and read irrespective of whether you've read the rest of the series which makes perfect sense it does yeah so all the characters get their the origin of their name for example uh, explained or the origin of a a previous injury explained every time they appear which um, is always quite uh, entertaining and actually sometimes what he does is he leaks a little bit of extra info every time once in a while yeah so the detail in the level of the story gets a bit more as you go through the series um, and there's not masses of it in Cop Hater because it is book one. And I, th- I have a feeling that he didn't really necessarily know which of the characters he puts in this book are going to be the ones that he carries through all of mm. it. But obviously he didn't know he was going to write 56 of them or whatever it is. He knew he had a three book deal. Mm. And he didn't even know necessarily that Steve Carella, Detective Steve Carella, was going to carry on beyond the third book. And I believe at one point he was thinking of killing him off. Now, that's a spoiler I should probably not have said, but it's... Uh, well, we'll, we'll look actually, into that later on. <laughs> but actually, it doesn't happen, so it's not a spoiler. It's fine, yes. It's a reverse spoiler? I don't Possibly. Know. <laughs> yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's an interesting point, because it's... You obviously, you read that book now, knowing that it's the first of 40, 40 or 50. Series, yeah. And yeah, it doesn't read that way. Uh, and comparing that to books in the later series, um, I know with some lengthy series, the, the characters, when you read them back in the first book, are no resemblance to the characters that you're reading about mm. in the later books. And yet mm. that, that is not something that you could point at this series that's, of that's books. That's very true, yeah. They, they um, kind of arrive pretty much form, don't they? Yeah, which is it's, astonishing, it's, really. It's not um, like, oh, well, we're actually going to keep this character around. Let's just actually kind of tweak it around a bit so to, it seems a bit more to, fully rounded. and to, to force him into whatever kind of um, um, yeah plot or... or scenario you want yeah, to but like, that, like the way sort of John McCarry did with George Smiley yeah. and characters like that just completely retconned them and, and changed them into different people exactly almost. yeah re-aged them kind of changed their personality and um, essentially they a lot of their traits were the same but yeah, yeah. they did sub, uh, substantially amend them for uh, later uh, books as we'll find with Ed McBain all he does is amend a few details just to make sense of it within the historical context because obviously He's keeping the same characters going, but it's covering a longer period of time than they would necessarily actually be serving policemen. Well, that's that's probably something worth mentioning because he's got a very clever way of the the, the books um, as you read them often start a month or so after the previous book, but obviously the pub- publishing time difference is a year 18 months two years whatever yeah. that might be some of them are, yeah some of them come out very quickly after the last very one, quickly all, almost i think there's a, a, a couple that almost out the, yeah. the uh, well i think the next podcast we do we won't be able to go over 1956 again because i think mm. it's still 1956 yeah, yeah the next one's published early on he was he was really just firing those novels out and, and they're, they're, they're short books and they're as you say they were written for a, a pulp publisher and they're, they're kind of just quick easy reads and I think as you get a bit further on, he starts to think about them a bit more, take a bit more time, and they yeah. get longer and a little bit more complex. But as yeah, Steve, you were saying, so they sort of the books themselves occur. Yeah, it's like the, the books in themselves are a bit of a relay in that um, there's yeah, there's no discontinuity between the entries when you're reading them, mm. and that's something I noticed reading them in order. Definitely, you probably yeah. notice a bit more because obviously you've just finished the the previous one. And given how addictive they are, it's normally a fairly <laughs> short period of time that you, yeah. you're putting down one and picking up the other. Um, so, yeah, you've got the characters who are very similar 
in themselves throughout the series. The age, not that. <laughs> very, well, some very of them, little. I think very, some of them don't age at all. Yeah, very little. Oh, yeah, uh, which is barely. slightly different to a retconning of the age. Mm. You know, I, I think it's a very different thing to reverse a character's age to ma- make them match, say, someone on TV. Um, like in a, if there's a famous adaptation or something mm. like that than it is to actually just freeze your characters in mm. time. Except they're not frozen in time. They're always appropriate they, to the yeah, time they're in. Yeah, definitely. They, they do age ever so slightly, but not so much in terms of years. Well, Indeed. They, yeah. And then odd little details from their lives will will be amended to, to, to fit with the, the, the time in which the book book's published. I, think, I would say my perception of the characters is probably that... Circa thirty in the in the yeah. uh, in, well, in in the early books and probably circa forty forty five in the later books. Yeah, uh, over a fifty over, year, over a fifty year period. period. Um, um, and in fact, when we start Cop Hater, nineteen fifty six, are we told his age? I don't know. We're not told his age, recall. but we are told he's been a cop for twelve years. Oh well. Mm. Detective second grade Stephen Lewis. So, yeah, he went straight into the academy. Uh, yeah. out of um, so that would that would figure for that. Yeah, he's, he's he's got to be a college boy though, right? So like maybe I think the so, academy yeah. from, early from thir- uni. That would place him early. Yeah, 30s, yeah so he's, he's he's already been in the force for twelve years by the first book, and he's still in it in in two thousand and five. He's doing all right, isn't so he? he? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Again, we don't want to spoil it, but he does grow as a person, but Certainly. just not in the way. Reality does. And, <laughs> you and see, one yeah. of the great things is you don't want it to. No. no. Um, and I think another thing that the non or the very modest aging of the uh, the cast is a bit of an ongoing joke. Certainly yeah, more the, so the, in the, the later the, the, books. The later on, it gets. He likes uh, playing around with the, the, the uh, narrator who uh, is like the city kind of another kind of character. Really, will drop in odd little joking references to it. It felt. It almost felt like ten years since. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, that's a good point. The narrator is 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 the first voice you hear, and it's the most consistent voice you hear mm. during the entire thing. And the first thing the narrator always talks about is the city itself, mm. Mm. and that includes the weather. Mm, the weather. Uh, yeah. So this is this is a, a hot book, isn't it? This I was is, going to say uh, this is a this is, this is a, a heat wave book. This one, mm. which is interesting because we're doing this podcast on one of the wettest days of the year, <laughs> um, but. It's yeah, it's amazing because it's almost like the the weather holds people hostage in this book. It's the thing that changes people's attitude, and it's hot touchy crimes, mm. um, which I'm sure there's a s- psychological studies of all sorts of things like this. But it's um, yeah, there's lots of language scenes taking place with mm. people trying to cool down in a time when air conditioning was was more of a luxury, and that's actually a funny thing because in in the UK, air conditioning is still a luxury in domestic <laughs> homes because we don't need it. Um, but obviously in America, and particularly in the cities, and in the in this city, which is a proxy New York, um, to which I've only been once, and, and it was the hottest place I've ever <laughs> been in the world. Um, it's and it's an essential. So it's 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 always there. This it's either heat or cold. It's always mm. intense. Yeah. And actually, sometimes it's nice, but that's always a bit of a a false sense of security. So I'd say the weather is almost another character in it itself. It definitely sets the mood before anything actually really happens in, in every novel in the series, doesn't mm, it, really? Doesn't it? Yeah. It's, it's not just this. It's, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a constant as well. Yeah, and but which could be terribly naff, but actually it, it really does put you in that... Mm. It, it can straightjacket you so often, whether if it's cold or it's hot, it really does. You know from the first chapter, the opening point, that you're... You can be you're sort of feeling what the the characters feel because you've been mm. straightjacketed by, by the dark or the cold or the, you know the the heat or whatever yeah. it is, and it's yeah. So everything usually starts with an amazing description of a city. I, I think that's also reminded me of um, yeah when you the, the the books as they go on because they they run concurrently in themselves and they quite often go from, you know, steamy hot weather novel followed by a depths of winter (laughs) novel and 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 round again so yeah so cop hater is well i think the first thing that hits you is the title isn't it yeah cop hater is a phenomenal title when i I first saw it it's like well this mean you know it's kind of packing a bit of a punch really isn't it blunt isn't it like particularly for a book from like the mid 50s it's it's coming out of an era 
where there's still a hangover from the kind of genteel sort of like uh, detective novel. Um, I know there've been sort of hard boiled things going on. There was Mickey Spillane and and everything, but also the, the, there were still people writing novels about um, some some sort of tough going to a, a mansion and um, some dreadful yeah. poisoning happening at a dinner party. Well, yeah, Agatha Christie's still writing at this point, and I, I you know, she's oh, the, yeah, the yeah. archetype of that. And I love Agatha Christie, but not to take anything away from well, any of that, of course. I love the Poirot books because who doesn't like a you know a fastidious Belgian? Everyone um, loves a fastidious Belgian, it's true. But you're entirely right. There is a there's a dominance uh, of that in the in the broader sense. I think uh, you know the big the big crime books that sell are that sort of thing, mm. and everything else is seen as pulp. Mm. Um, but so this comes along, and it's this is called Cop Hater, and you're already imagining some sort of some sort of baddie, some sort of uh, antagonist in this and in fact well let's deal with and i think we're gonna to have to deal with this in every book we look at let's deal with the death count um we get told that um the uh, lieutenant for the precinct it was lieutenant peter burns um bullet-headed bullet-headed, he is as he's bullet-headed. This is true. um liked by some not by others um although i think he's a fairly sympathetic character oh, he, very yeah he, so. he um, comes across well and certainly in this, uh, Corella talks about getting on with him, whether some other cops talk about him being a bit of a, a lunk and that they don't like. He'd be a, a, an ever present in the uh, series as well. Yeah, so he's one of our he's one of our favourites. Yeah, he mentions that they've got a sixteen men squad, but he actually only names six detectives in it. Uh, he says that there's five of them on stakeout, so couldn't be brought in. Oh, yeah, but the book's called Cop Hater, so it's no surprise that. Of the six named detectives in this book, 50% of them are killed during the course of it. <gasps> there's going to be some spoilers on there. Yeah, it's going to happen. Can, uh, there was that. some cop-hating going on. Yeah, there's some definite you know, <clears throat> cop-hating live without a net type stuff. True. But I think, I think that's like a great feature of the book is that the, 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 this new world is presented to you and then you re- spend the rest of the book reading about it being ripped apart. Yeah. And it's such a great way of introducing you to this world and then no, I changing agree. it in front of your very Definitely. eyes. Yeah, you're then introduced to... to characters who you think are going to be your protagonists yeah. as well. All the um, way through the book. But because obviously, it, 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 as you say, it's a, a, a gestalt hero. So the, your, your hero is all of the squad and they're introducing you to them. And then as the, you're just getting to know them, they're being killed off in front of your eyes. Yeah, And he doesn't pretend to introduce them in a... In a in a cursory way, he oh, introduces all. them all as in the same way, so you you get the same sort of little details of background. With, mm. um, for instance, uh, David Foster, um, who is one of the victims, but he he gets basically a page of introduction, mm. and the next time we see him, he's dead. Mm. Yeah, having read like one of the books from twenty five years later first, and seen the way the the characters were introduced, I was just assuming the, these were people I, w- I was going to get to know for several <laughs> volumes, and then, uh, oh, maybe not. Yeah. So yeah, he doesn't pull any punches, and I think it's important. Actually, it's a good point that this is about cops. So if this was a police procedural, which is what we're calling this genre of novel, um, but it was literally them investigating crimes committed by, by and to a third party type thing, the public, you know, villains on villains or whatever it is. All of which happens at, at some point mm. in the series. The fact that it's committed, it's crimes committed on cops forces you to look inside the precinct, forces you to look at how cops act. Absolutely, yeah. And so that's a really important point. One of my questions is, is it a novel of its time? Is it forward-looking or is it backward-looking? Or does it have bits of everything, you know? This is something that intrigues me because of his background in pulp sort of publishing. Mm. And like we've said about the the things that went before... Mm. He couldn't have written it without all that stuff happening. No, I don't think he could. I, I always found it, you know, a lot less pulpy than a lot of the other pulp novels of that time, which are yeah. all to a much greater extent 
ridiculous. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> how, you know, that's their appeal, really. Oh, dear, yeah, um, definitely. I mean, you know, the, 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 there's a certain joy in, in Mike Hammer going around and you know that every couple of pages someone's going to get killed and he's going to sleep with someone um, and he's going to make loads of like really corny kind of um, sub malo quips and and then the cycle repeats and then the book ends. I think uh, of what I've read, I think that the closest of the kind of nasty kind of world is, is painted here is a, a big fan of uh, Donald E. Wesley, Richard Stark, but that's early mid sixties, really. So that's yeah, really. some years. Because it's, it's one of those things where the sixties is seen as a very forward-looking mm. decade. It's it's pushing boundaries in all sorts of ways. The fifties is seen as the the sort of settling after the war, yeah. The re-establishment of family systems, all that sort of stuff, and 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 actually, perhaps as a, a sort of a foot in the past of like let's regain mm. the values that we perhaps had to put aside. Whereas I think this is more going towards the 60s. It is going backwards. I I think it's it's a really bold kind of move to start a a series like that. There are definitely precedents for the police procedural. I mean, there were standalone police procedural novels. Mm. People argue they go back to Wilkie Collins in the... The Moonstone. uh, Yeah, like the 1800s, but I don't think anyone attempted like a, an ongoing series with a whole squad of detectives. Yeah, it was still just a way of having an individual, wasn't it, as they de- featured? De- definitely, yeah. Uh, and they, they might look at the process, but it was still it was still just a, a minor variation on the detective novel format. And I, I, I guess there was a trend towards, uh, with things like Dragnet on, on the radio, and I think there were sort of... Um, uh, there was a trend in films towards things that focused more on actual police pr- procedure too, but I think McBain was really the first person to kind of seize on that and create like an ongoing series out of it and make it human as well. Absolutely. So I think yeah. from what I know of Dragnet, it starts on the radio, it goes on the TV mm. very quickly, yeah, and it is it's black and white. It's very much like a, a serialized TV version of those cop films mm-hmm. you know it happens in uh, 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it is um i've not seen them for donkey's years they were on i'm sure like something like bbc2 mm. at one point they were showing them in the day or something like that but it's very much that sort of fast talking high trousers stuff mm. <laughs> um, still but obviously it had a massive impact mm. and and I don't think these books would exist. The 87 Precinct books oh, would no. not exist without Dragnet. Certainly not. But they move it forward because they really, really humanise the, mm. the characters. Yeah, and I mean, there, there are certainly things in the novel that that pin it to its its time, but I, I think in terms of the format of it, um, it feels a lot more like things that came in the next several decades mm. of crime writing than, than anything that had come before. Uh, it, you know... Um, there are things that will absolutely pinpoint it in the mid fifties. Yeah. Um, uh, I think what's something we should do is is at some point if we can get hold of it, we should watch the eighty seventh precinct TV series, oh, which was made that. in the sixties but looks like Dragnet. <laughs> and mm. so that's sort of backwards looking in a yeah. way. From and I've seen one episode of it and it's good, but it's uh, got Peter Falcon and um, we will return to Peter Falcon Columbo at another point. <laughs> um, but yeah, talking about humanising. So Steve Carell is our main cop in this, of the team. And he, in this book, he doesn't propose, but he reinforces his proposal to uh, Theodora Franklin, Teddy, who it becomes his wife at the end of this book. And she is a deaf mute, which... I think could have been a terrible thing to do to a mm. female character because it, it, it could have made a entirely a subservient character, to, you know, unable to communicate, helpless, needing, you know, needing to be propped up all the time. But right from the off, she's actually strong and interesting and powerful. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. And a, a very addictive character because it sets the writer a challenge mm. to make her so, and therefore you become sort of bound up in it. But, he does tend a little bit towards the sexy in this book. Well, this is true, <laughs> and he does, and so he does use uh, he does use women as um, 
sort of femme fatales. This, well, very much so. Probably more so than in some of the later books when the series is established. Yeah. At the time, he was still just trying to, he was trying to sell a series he of was, three yeah. books. So, it's a, Yeah, it's a funny co- uh, element to the books, that, because there's certainly a, 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 a short run of them in the 80s or early 90s, which are kind of strangely kind of sexy plots yes, which is uh, yeah. <laughs> a bit out of the blue and they kind of they arrive as soon as they disappear really but it's a <laughs> I think it's a little um, yeah an yeah. indulgence he has every now and then and I think yeah uh, totally absent from some of the books mm. and present but it's in perhaps others, one really. of the uh, the genre features that that he retains really mm. and, and also one of the things that people say about genre books is that it casts people in certain roles yeah However, what I would say that uh, Teddy, Teddy Carella, as she becomes after this book, is a, a really strong character. Mm. And um, she, in this book, becomes the the point towards the denouement where where it all kicks off, basically. Yep. So, what, this, is, this is great. There's a character in this called um, Savage who is a reporter who is going after a story about gangs, try to whip up some fervour about teenage teenage angst and violence. Pesky teenage hoodlums. Which, obviously, Ed McBain knew all about because he'd written Blackboard Jungle. Indeed. And so he is ironically writing a character who's trying to do what everyone was doing after Blackboard Jungle came out, which was, say, look at these crazed teens... He's, he's taken that sort of media reaction to the film and the book and put it into a character. And Savage becomes the device that actually causes Teddy to be imperiled in this. And it's her wits that enable the book to end the way we want them to mm. end, which is with an arrest. Yep. So do they arrest the cop hater at the end? Who's the first person arrested? Is it the cop hater? It's, it's well. Oof. They they uh, they, they, they um, it takes a while to get to the actual cop hater. Yeah. Um, the, the, the actual cop hater is not necessarily the the murderer. No, indeed. The murderer is in fact a tool of uh, the cop hater of the title. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Ah. So yeah, we we this is one of the great things about the title of the book and the, and the structure of the story is. He's not leading you down a dark alley. He's not trying to trick you with with loads of red herrings or or tons of distractions. Mm. He's showing you the process of of actually doing detection. And it, it becomes ludicrously nerdy. And one of my favourite things about these <laughs> books is they have a lot of, of reproduced things like um, prisoner transcripts um, for sentencing or... Um, firearms permits yeah and they're reproduced as, as graphics in the book yeah they'll show you the actual document so yeah you get a real feel for how this the, the whole and, procedure uh, goes yeah. through well he, he clearly did a, an absurd amount of, of research in in how the the procedures worked in the, uh, the time and i recall in a lot of the early books as in this one i think the um they always have fairly long scenes of where they all have to go to City Hall, is it? Or the, uh, oh, for the line, for the line, for line yeah. yeah, which obviously disappears in the series as it disappeared in, yeah, in, so in, it in does real follow, life. It does follow established procedure, uh, yes. as it says in the little, the little uh, blurb at the uh, start. And I have, yeah, and the, the forward of this, um, um, Evan Hunter, Ed McBain, kind of mentions how much he... He was pestering real policemen, sergeants, you yeah. know, everyone connected with, you know, the law and order. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of the reason for having the fictional city, were, wasn't it, so that he didn't have to keep doing that because it was going to be impossible to keep up with, up to date with realistic procedure. Yeah. And, uh, and with the NYPD. And I um, think uh, that was the series. It was originally envisaged as just three or four, but um, clearly that would have been totally unsustainable for 40-odd without Absolutely. just having a parallel history of the same city, whereas exactly, it just yeah. it just freed freed him up for, yeah, for all sorts yeah. of... It's, uh, it's the sort of book where you can have a sentence that involves the, the, the words, since the formula H by R over L by BS, by RA over LA, by RV over LV, by RAA over LAA, dot LL over RL, 
by LB over RB by X and that actually be relevant to the plot. Yeah, <laughs> Even though I probably read it out wrong. I think that's to do with right foot, left foot, stride length and things like that. <laughs> but it's about, you know, establishing how tall the yep. perpetrator possibly was. And this is all taken from half a heel print cast yep. from some uh, some dog muck <laughs> that he stands in. It is amazing. Well, then going back to uh, you mentioned about the, the little um, inclusions of forms and in some of the later books little clues and codes yeah. and whatnot you know it just reinforces how like fun they are and they are there's a little you know kind of a yeah a childish kind of um I, I, in a vein to them you know real fun, well, it, fun it's, uh, it's like the opposite of sherlock holmes isn't yeah, it so instead of holmes to... explaining how he's done it in his own head and showing that what a smart ass he, he has is someone at the like, end he kind of like yes he has sam grossman the uh the the uh, police lieutenant who's responsible for this stuff is he a lieutenant? Have I rest- oh god, I haven't got that wrong. I, I, I haven't got him marked down. Forgotten what his his rank is, to be honest. I, th- I think he might be a lieutenant, uh, but he's he could be. basically in charge of forensics, and hmm. and so he has him explain it through science. Yep. And it, yeah, it doesn't become any less interesting. Well, I think indeed. it makes it much more yeah. interesting. He, he works through science. The others work through just sort of sheer hard work and occasional bits of luck and. Yep some bits of ingenuity and you see their mistakes as well as their triumphs. And it's, it's not like just some brilliant mind working away in solitude. And then they come out with this incredible resolution. Sometimes it seems like they've come up with something brilliant and it turns out they're completely wrong. Yeah. That's, and this, this is something that carries on throughout and it, 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 and it is fantastic because you, you live it with them as well. And that makes it just, such an interesting journey and why it's i think why it's quite addictive because it's almost like if you've got a bunch of these on your shelf you feel like getting up and going to work with these guys the next day yeah. because you know it's going to be horrible but like fascinating <laughs> mm. um and i think it's as much um you're fascinated as much i uh, i think with the, with the characters as, as you are with the city as well because I've, mm. I've read other series of um Lengthy series, you know, great books to read. But if they're they're all set in a real place, you know, New York or LA or mm. where, wherever, well, you 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 might know generally the history of that place, and therefore, mm. what surprises really are they going to have up their sleeve? Whereas, in in this fictional city, you've um, you've no idea. You know, yeah. it'll take you absolutely anywhere. Once in a while, they can spend a few pages just discoursing on a whole kind of history of a segment of the city that he's never mentioned before, and it's. Yeah, really fascinating to... Yeah. to, to, to My favourite chapter in this book is chapter 17. And it's partly because it contains ludicrous detail about the number of doctors in this city. <laughs> um, and like we say, it's a city without a name, but he, he breaks it down into regions, um, which all correspond in some way to uh, New York region. But it's also a point where Corella just has to deal with a crank who turns up, who starts talking, <laughs> of, who blames all the murders on cockroach people. Well, it seems plausible to me. And the great way he introduces it is by she comes in and says, you're not being bugged, are you? There's not a bug here. And when he thinks, well, like a microphone, she's like, no, a giant cockroach person. <laughs> and yet he has to do what a cop would have to do, which is deal with it. And yep. she's going, they talk by radio nuclear thermics. I think they must be from another planet, don't you? <laughs> Possibly, Corella said. <laughs> so... Um, He's he's not averse to uh, a, a little bit of uh, madness like that as well because I think it's I think that's probably what happens as mm. well. Uh, Foster was the Black Prince of Argadon, she said. Um, maybe that's a little throwback to his sci-fi uh, Quite pulp possibly, days as yeah. well. Perhaps he had the phrase Black Prince of Argadon in his yeah, head and felt I've got to get it out somewhere. <laughs> so, right, okay. Well, this is. This is Cop Hater, and what I think we've done here is we've we've talked a little bit about Cop Hater, but we've talked about the the approach in general to these mm. novels, which I think is going to be an essential thing for introducing people to it. And hopefully, you have got an idea about how interested, how interesting the books are, how how much we like them, and and some of the rec- reasons why we're recommending them. Um, I think it's important if you're approaching the f- first one, and I think. After all, you know, all these years, you're gonna know it's part of a a big series. Mm. You see them in charity shops and whatnot. You know, there's a lot out there, and I think it's 
important. You know, well, it's useful to have, a, a, as I had through you, Morgan, a, a, a picture painted of what they're all about, really. <laughs> and um, you know, it's not. It seems a bit daunting to have fifty to go out and thinking, oh, crikey, and be. But once you get into it, it's oh, really like yeah. delightful to have fifty to go out. Exactly. Because yeah. then 50, you know you're not going to run out. Fifty is simply not enough in the end. Yeah, it's it's. Um, it, there's a sort of sadness in that. I think we all started reading them at a point where they were still being written, mm-hmm. and then suddenly there was a point where they would never be written again. Yeah. But that's not to yeah that's that's not to put you off it. It should encourage no. you the the volume that's there Absolutely, to be uh, yeah. it's, to it's, be tackled either yeah. in order or not in order. It really makes no difference. Yeah, I, I think you're entirely right with that. Um, so, cop hater, then are we going to rate it? I mean, this is do we rate? I think if we take this approach, then we've not spoiled too much, I don't think, particularly, because I don't, I don't think we've actually given away who the killer no, is. I don't think Maybe we, have. we should do that as a principle. Maybe we should never give away who the killer is. Oof, I don't know if that's going to be possible, but <laughs> I think in this case, I, I just, in order to, to drive people to uh, the charity shops to find Cop Hater, because I don't yeah. think you can get it in most bookshops. I was in. Um, this, I think this is one of the slightly rarer well, ones. I, I, I would say, which is odd because it's the first in the, mm. it's in the weird, series. It's weird. They're kind of going in and out of print as well, which yeah. which is is tricky, isn't it? Yeah, it's and actually the most recent Ed McBain books that you can get in a bookshop are reprints of some of the really pulpy things. Mm. Which I think I bought you one of those for a, a present one. You know, proper yellow spine pulp things. And yeah, it's very strange that in a crime. It's such a significant book in such a significant series that mm. it's very hard to get hold of. Mm. But it makes that trawling through those bookshops so much more rewarding oh, yes. when you find a, a, a stash of them. And mm. I remember striking gold on like a Utoxeter market stand and Absolutely. things like that. So you have a story attached to them as well. Definitely. Also, it's probably worth saying that if you're it's one of these soulless people who doesn't want to troll through um, endless secondhand bookshops, you, you can get quite a lot of Ed McBain books for... Either next to nothing yeah. or nothing as as downloads for your Kindle. And yeah, eBay is a good place to go. Yeah, I got the physical lots thing. from eBay for next to nothing, pretty much postage only, quite a lot. And so, it's Christmas um, nearly, so why not treat yourself? Absolutely, and, or, or a loved one. <laughs> you know, look after each other. <laughs> so, so if we if we were to rate it then on, uh, I think I, if, I think a rating that one could incorporate all the pieces that you look for in um, uh, an 87th Precinct, having read quite a few of them. I think um, this is, because this is the first book, because it does what it does, I think out of five shields, which I'm going to, which I think is uh, should be our rating system because mm. we've all got an edition that has an 87th Precinct Police Shield sure badge, indeed. a badge on the front. Yep. Um, I can't help but give this a full five shields because it's, it's, it's the bedrock. Well... Feel free to. Uh... I, I think I would give this four Oof. because I th- I would to think somewhere for it to go it, it, a little bit and also um, I think the of the series the five star ones I think I will reserve for the um, the plots I think there's some with a lot more complex plots I would say which are a bit a bit more satisfying in that respect and also the the ones that I really really love in the series of where as the squad becomes established you've got most mm. of them involved in some shape or form and so for well, that yeah. slight reason and to give me somewhere else to go <laughs> in the future um I think yes I, it's certainly a very memorable one oh, and yeah. it, it, you know it's uh, it must be ten years or so since I've read it all the way through, um, and yet can remember others less so, um, mm-hmm. uh, but very memorable and is an incredibly enjoyable uh, start to the series. Morgan, well, I love it and it's tremendous and it establishes a lot of what's to come in the series. It doesn't have absolutely everything that I love in the series, mm. and for that reason and that reason alone, it's getting a solid but not. Totally outstanding, uh, but very respectable. Four shields out of five. I think that's that's fair enough. I think I'm reacting to it in a little bit like when you go to a gig and you really enjoy it, and you come out and go, "That's the best band ever." And then you wake up in the morning and you think, apart from all the other bands I like, yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, I think well, that's, that's just that's the way totally... I'm choosing to emotionally react to it. That's very valid. That's so how I, that I react to almost it. every scenario I'm in. 
that give, gives it an overall tremendously healthy 13 shields out of 15 so <laughs> well that's i mean you know you has can't any other book ever had 13 shields out of 15 did, well, did, did any jane case. austen novel ever get 13 <laughs> no. shields out of 15 i think not no yeah well i think that's a, a good point very well made right i well i think we'll wrap this one up um and so i think we need to point out that our twitter feed is at hark 87 podcast our email should you wish to um, send us really, really long messages of um, hate and dismissal. Correct it, <laughs> correcting all our... Correcting uh, yeah, everything our... we've got wrong. <laughs> Which I'm sure there's quite a... Quite a uh, everything um... you say is apocryphal! <laughs> um, we enjoy uh, apocrypha. Yeah. Our email is hark87podcast at gmail.com and the SoundCloud is soundcloud.com slash hark87podcast. It was quite good. No one else had taken that username. <gasps> Who would have thought? Who would have thought? And so, anyway, we return um, in the future at some point for the second book in the series, which I believe is The Mugger. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.